Yes, yes, you are on the air. We will bring you Nikhil live from the Fez. Momentarily. Get with the program, Nick. It spread out through the city. It was in a subterranean place just like this. And it spread out from there into the streets, the subways. All the carnage of World War II was left behind in the muck and the sludge. And what came out of that was a bright shining star. And that star's name was Neil Cassidy. He had another star, a twin star, that moved with him through land and time. And that star's name was Jack Kerouac. They rode the bebop of Charlie Parker. They rolled the cool sounds of Miles Davis. They brought back into life the knowledge that in you, you have the touch. Every one of you has the touch. Every one of you has the beatific soul that the beats kept alive for us today. And that star has risen once again, is our star. Don't forget there are five billion inhabitants of this planet. No two have the same fingerprint. Your fingerprint is your own print. Make your print. Do your print. And when you do your print, what well, do your stop do? So what? gentlemen, Ken Babs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to uh, welcome you all to Fez, welcome you all in Radio Land. We are on the air broadcasting throughout this region. I want to welcome you all to the fifth anniversary broadcast of this weekly live music program known as the Music Closet. You're listening to WFMU, Uppsala College, East Orange, New Jersey. Tonight's program, the Neil Cassidy Memorial Broadcast. There's a lot of uh, words on the radio, but live words from real human beings can be very threatening to the powers that be. Uh, it's very dangerous as a radio programmer in this day and age to put live words on the radio, believe it or not. It's a frightening thing that we live in this uh, age when words can be dangerous. Scary. My name is Nicholas Hill, the host of this program, and I would like to introduce to you a uh, fellow comrade in crime, Mr. Kim Spurlock, a oral historian and beat nimblest. Mendicant. That's Mendicant. Kim Spurlock. Yes, yeah, thank you, and greetings. Oh, wait yes. Before we introduce each other here, I want to introduce the angel-headed hipsters who this evening have comprised themselves. Mr. Jeff Buckley over here. Tony Maimoni on bass. 
Timothy Hill on piano. Tim Sternberg on Doombeck. And the illustrious Philip Dre, without whom we'd have no bongos this evening. He's got the beret. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Spurlock. Uh, yes, and greetings, uh, free men and virgins, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, I just, uh, by way of in evocation, uh, beat from the second century. The slave seeks only to be free, and he does not hope to acquire the estate of the master. But the son is not only a son, but lays claim to the inheritance of the father. Those who are heirs to the dead are themselves dead, and they inherit the dead. Those who are heirs to what is living are alive, and they are heirs to both what is living and the dead. The dead are heirs to nothing, for what can he who is dead inherit? He who is dead inherits what is living. He, he who is dead inherits what is living, he will not die, but he who is dead will live even more. Gospel of Philip. Uh, a long lost fragment, uh, a poem of, of uh, Neocastes. He wasn't known as a poet. Uh, he blew free verse most of the time, and, uh, but this is one that he wrote down, 1951. I'm on the wings of Tangerian swells, for from flowing fable on fable comes a pattern of bells that pressure the mind and weaken the bowels, tis true, but not as other things do. So I long to lick the limp lard's larder, the lip glands larder, of bubbly juices and harder tartar, and make ye amends with a woman's tits and farter, and stick my neck in the noose of her garter, a playthings above it to which I'm a barter. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, I would like to introduce at this point Ken Babs. Uh, he is the original prankster archivist from the get-go, uh, ex-marine, and uh, he's here, he's an author of the uh, Cassie issue of Spit in the Ocean, and on the bus, and he's here to MC for us tonight. So, uh, Ken Babs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All the Thank way. You. Thank you. All the way. From the majestically tranquil Willamette Valley. Ah, uh, oh, very true. Do you always say Willamette? Damn it! If you ever Willamette. go there, Willamette. Damn it! <laughs> well, I spoke so highly of those two wonderful stars, Neil Cassidy and Jack Kerouac, who buddied together and traveled together. Everybody knows about this, or you wouldn't be here. But along with us tonight, the third member of this tremendous group of guys that came out, and girls and whoever, of the beat movement that came up, this flower, this beautiful flower that blew out of the carnage that is still our legacy. And now I really feel like the flower is blooming again. For some reason this year, we're getting something happening that we got to stomp and dance and have a good time to, because who knows how much longer it's going to last this time. But we're going to go again, and we're still here to do it. And here's the man who is still alive, has kept it together, and been through so much. Uh, it, hey, speaking of this, you know that the reason we're here is uh, tomorrow is Neil Casty's birthday, February the 8th. But the question is, how old would he be tomorrow were he still alive? I've had 63. Let me hear it a little more now. Give me a 63, 63. I'm going to be a little 64. I'm going to get a 64, 64. Yeah, 64. No, I have 67. I'm going to get 67. Is anybody got to get 67? Anybody got 67, 67, 67? 68. This young lady's got it. He was 67 today, but tomorrow he'd be 68. Just the opposite of 86. Well, he'd never get 86 out of here. Not that man. But the man who has survived and who has kept the torch alive for a good many years, and I've had the pleasure of being with his company so many times. One time we were at Naropa doing a thing, and he got up on the stage and he was playing in the blues. He was playing the blues, and he was singing with the blues. And I was back there, my, my buddy Ken Kesey, we were sitting down there, and uh, Alan was up there uh, playing and singing the blues. Oh, boy, I hope I got it here. And Kesey was back down there, and he had this thing in his pocket. And pretty soon he was, he was doing it. He was flashing it. It was going on and off. And it was a little light going off and off in the pocket there. And Alan's up there and he's singing. He's singing, uh, Stormy Monday, Tuesday just bad. A Wednesday I eat corned beef and Thursday I feel so bad. But the eagle poops on Friday. Saturday I go out to play. Sunday I get down on my knees and I begin to pray. And you know what I say? I say, 
Lord have mercy on a sinner like me. If anybody sees my baby, won't you please ask her, come back to me. And all this time, this light's flashing in Keezy's pocket. Alan's eyes are getting bigger and bigger. So pretty soon, he's singing, won't somebody please turn that flashlight off before it gets to me? Ladies and gentlemen, our old friend and trusted savant, Alan Gidsberg. See, which uh, mic am I using? This? You can have that one, yes. And, Wolf, well, would you like to discuss any of the things that have happened to us for the last uh, 76 years or anything? Yeah. Uh, we were talking about something when we first came on. We, we sure were. We were talking about our health and the fact oh, that yes, you yes, are looking yes, so good and yes. there's being survivals and the... Yes, macrobiotic diet. Uh, can That's you believe the that? the important thing. Yes. You talk about the wheels yes, going sir. around, huh? Here's a guy uh, in 93 doing macrobiotic. Probably if Neil and yourself had uh, been on a macrobiotic diet, you'd uh, be as old as I am now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, I hope to be as old as you are someday. Well, I hope to be as old as my stepmother, who's uh, 87 now. Oh, terrific. And, uh, really good. Uh, it's, it's, uh, longevity has its virtues. Oh, you, well, look at Nixon. He's 80. It's nice to sleep with younger people. But for wisdom, you've got to go to the older people. That's right. So, uh, wisdom, poetry, then I'll, uh, that's my role, poet. So I'll start with poems that I wrote, first poem that I wrote in Neil Cassidy's house, kind of a love poem, 1953, called uh, The Weight of the uh, Song, actually is what it's called. The weight of the world is love. Under the burden of solitude, under the burden of dissatisfaction, the weight, the weight we carry, is love. Who can deny? In dreams, it touches the body. In thought, constructs a miracle. In imagination, anguishes till born in human, looks out of the heart burning with purity. For the burden of life is love, but we, carry the weight wearily, and so must rest in the arms of love at last. Must rest in the arms of love. No rest without love. No sleep without dreams of love. Be mad or chill, obsessed with angels or machines. The final wish is love cannot be bitter, cannot deny, cannot withhold if denied. The weight is too heavy, must give for no return, as thought is given in solitude, in all the excellence of its excess. The warm bodies shine together in the darkness, the hand moves to the center of the flesh, the skin trembles in happiness and the soul comes joyful to the eye. Yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted, I always wanted to come back to the body where I was born. That's 1954, actually. <laughs> On Neil's ashes. Delicate eyes that blinked blue Rockies, all ash. Nipples, ribs that I touched with my thumb are ash. Mouth, my tongue touched once or twice, all ash. Bony cheeks soft on my belly are cinder. Ash earlobes and eyelids, youthful cock tip, curly pubis, breast warmth, man palm, high school thigh, baseball annealed to silken skin, all ashes, all ashes again, ashes again. The 
those are uh, poems that are published. Those are poems that are published, and then in uh, homage to uh, Ken Babs and uh, the later generation of Merry Pranksters, who picked up and uh, played with Neil and uh, drove with him years later, uh, in the 60s decade, I, a uh, sort of visionary dream I had a few years ago called I Went to the Movie of Life, dealing with the Mary Prankster's Caravan. I don't know, have you ever heard this, Ken? No, no, I want to hear it. Go okay. <laughs> it's a dream. All right. Uh, I had just been down in uh, Tutwiler, Mississippi, the, the, the route of the home of the blues, the uh, Delta area with Harry Smith, who was a uh, great blues uh, archivist. And while I was there, I had this dream. I went to the movie of life, in the mud, in the night, in Mississippi Delta roads outside Clarksdale, I s slogged along, lights flashed under trees, my black companion motioned, here they are, your company. Like giant rhinoceri with painted faces splashed over her side and snout, headlights glaring in rain, one after another buses rolled past us toward the book hotel boarding house up the hill, town ahead. Accompanying me, two girls pitched in the dark slush garbaged road, slipping in deep ruts, wheels had left behind sucking at their high heels, staining granny dresses sequined, magic marked with astral signs, head groupies who knew the way to this grateful dead half-century hero's caravan pit stop for the night. I climbed mid-road, a, a toad hopped before my foot, I shrank aside, unthinking, kicked it off with leather shoe, animal feet scurried back at my sight. A little monster on his back bled red. Nearby this prey, a lizard with, a, with large eyes retreated and a rat curled tail and slithered in mud wet to the dirt gutter, repelled. A long climb ahead, the girls would make it with me when I came. I moved ahead, eager to rejoin old company, merry pranksters with aged pride and peacock's feathered beds, shining mylar mirror paper walls, acid mothers with strobe-lit radios, long-haired men, gaunt sixties diggers emerged from the night to rest, bathe, cook spaghetti, nurse their kids, smoke pipes and squat with the Indian sages round charcoal braziers in their cars. Profound American dreamers, I was in their company again after long years, byways alone looking for lovers in bar, street, country, towns and sunlit cities, rain and shine, snow and spring, bud, backyard, brick walls, ominous adventures behind the Iron Curtain. Were we all grown old? I looked for my late boyfriends dancing to electric blues with their guns and smoke round jukebox, jukebox walls, the smell of hash and country ham. Old newspaper media stars wandering room after room. Pentagon refugee Daniel Ellsberg. Old dove David Dellinger, the anti-war resistor, the war resistor's anti-Vietnam prophet, bathing in an iron tub with a patch in his stomach wall. Abby Hoffman explaining the natural strategy of city political saint works. Quick silver messenger musicians. Berkeley orators with half-grown children in their socks and dirty faces. Alcohol uncles who played chess and strummed banjos, banjos frayed by broken fingernails. Where is Ken Kesey? Away tonight in another megalopolis hosting hypnosis parties for Hell's Angels? Maybe nail them down on stage or radio. Neil must be tending his daughters in Los Gatos, pacifying his wife, coming down from amphetamines in his bedroom, or downers to sleep this night away and wake for work in the Great Bay Carnival tented among smokestacks, railroad tracks, and freeways under box house urban hills. Young movie stars with grizzled beards passed through the bus corridors looking for Dylan in the movie office. 
re-swaggering old roles, recorded words of theirs now sung years later in Leningrad and Shanghai, their wives in tortoise shell glasses and paisley shawls and towels tending cauldrons bubbling with spaghetti sauce and racks of venison, squirrel or lamb, ovens open with hot rhubarb pies. Whom should I love here with one with leather hat, blonde hair, strong body middle age, face frowned in awful thought, beer in hand by the bathroom wall? That digger boy I knew with giant phallus, bald head studying medicine walk by, preoccupied now with his anatomy homework going back to college years later, rolling a joint, his thick fingers at his chest, eyes downcast on paper and tobacco. One by one, I checked them out as love companions, none whose beauty stayed my heart. This place was tired of my adoration. They knew my eyes too well. No one I could find to give me bed tonight and wake me grinning naked with eggs scrambled for breakfast ready, oatmeal, grits, or hot spicy sausages at noon assembly when I opened my eyes out of dream. I wandered, walking room through room to, through psychedelic buses, wanting to meet someone new, younger than this crowd of wily, wrinkled wanderers with their booze and families, electronic arts and crafts, woe-lined brows of chemical genius music producers, adventurous politicians, singing ladies and earthly paramours playing rare parts in the final movie of a generation. The cameras rolled and followed me. Was I the central figure in this film? We had passed dark starred crossroads and risen over bridges the ghost-lit caravan party of gypsy intellects had passed through USA in front of an eye recording tape better in celluloid. I'd known most faces and guided the invisible cameras room to room pausing at candlelit bus windows on flooded cotton fields we'd seen by daylight, familiar stars whispering by coal stoves, poetic headline artists known from Rolling Stone and New York Times, actors and actresses from the living theater, gaunt-faced and eloquent with lifted hands and bony fingers greeting me on my way to the bus driver's wheel, tattered dirty gloves on Neil's seat, waiting his return from working the National Railroad. Young kids I had taught saluting me wearily from worn couches as I passed bus to bus, cameras moving behind me. What was my role? I hardly knew these faded heroes, friendly strangers so long on the road. I'd been out teaching in Boulder, Manhattan, Budapest, London, Brooklyn so long. Why follow me through these amazing further bus party reunion corridors tonight? Or is this movie or real? If I turn to face the camera, I'd break the scene dissolve the plot illusion, or is it illusion art, or just my life? Were cameras over there, ever? The picture flowed so evenly before my eyes. How could a crew following the, me invisible, still and smoothly, noiseless, bus to bus, from room to room along the caravan's painted labyrinth? This wasn't cinema, and I know hero smoke, spokesman documenting friendship scenes. Only myself alone, lost in the cabin with familiar strangers, still looking for some sexual angel for mortal delights, no different from haunting St. Mark's Boys Bar again, solitary in a tie and jacket and gray beard, wallet in my pocket full of cash and cards, useless. A glimmer of lights in the curtained doorway before me, my heart leapt forward to the orgy room. Oh, youths, youths, lithe and hairless, smooth-skinned, white buttocks, ankles, young men's nipple chest lit behind the curtain, thighs entwined in the male area. <clears throat> the place I was looking for behind my closed eyelids all night, this night, I pushed my hand into the room, 
moving aside the curtain that shimmered within, bright with naked knees and shoulders, pale in candlelight, entered the pleasure chambers, empty door, glimmering silver shadows reflected on the silver curtained veil, eyelids still dazzling as their adolescent libs intangible dissolved where I put my hand into the vacant room, lay down on its dark floor to watch the lights of phantom arms pulsing behind closed eyelids conscious as I woke in bed, returned at dawn to New York wood slatted Venetian blinds over the windows on East 12th Street in my white painted room. Ladies Ladies and Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, Allen yeah. Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg is right. That man is our rabbi and gave us our invocation for a celebration. Yeah, we've passed the ashes on down now. We're going to get away from that. Uh, well, you know, uh, just to fill you in on this thing, uh, I'm sure everybody knows this by now, but uh, Neil Casty, I met him back in about 60 when I was running around uh, Stanford there with Keys and the gang. We put the bus together. And Neil had just gotten out of the penitentiary for doing two joints for two years. He smoked two years and they gave him two joints. Can you imagine that? What kind of goddamn thing do they give you out there in California when you misbehave? <laughs> so anyway, when he got out, we said, okay, Neil, you're gonna be all right as long as you don't do two at once. Mwah. Wait a minute, Ken Babs is now lighting up two at hurt. once. So anyway, his job was to drive. And that man could drive. I mean, you talk about going around this corner and get ready for that. Yes, man. And you going to go through that stop sign? No, I didn't go too fast. I went too first when I did. You know what happened right there, Peter? Right front tire came off. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? All you're going to do at that point is blast. Blast. That's right. Now, except you know you're going around this curb, going around that curb. You've got to go on the other side. Of that rail in or else I mean to tell you the truth. Blast. To smash it. Sweet? No, I can't. What? I'm getting too old. Yeah, but this is a performance. This is this can't be really the thing. You know what? You heard what happened to Lenny Bruce. I already got enough bad habits. You want me to get more? Uh, yeah, I just want to keep up the ones I already got. Give I me mean, five. Okay, okay. I only got two. But now I'll give me a kiss. Never done that before. <laughs> this is the first. But he sprayed me with his cologne. I mean, what's a guy gonna do? Do I smell good, Peter? Do I smell good? Let me blow you again. No, no. What's enough? No. One blow is enough. I can't. I'm wilted. Turn your other cheek. <laughs> Turn the other cheek. You got 20. 20 cheeks. Hey, you girls come up here one Don't at a time. Let him, let him spray you with, with this stuff. You're like a cat, a male cat does. A civet. When he comes around, he's got to spray everything. Come on up here one at a time, ladies. Let him spray you with this stuff. Come on. Don't be shy. First one up here gets hit on this fake joint. Hey, we have a couple coming up. So symbolic tonight. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, that's, uh, give her a spray. Forty dollars a bottle of perfume. It's just for men, but ladies can have it too. Cheek to cheek. Cheek to cheek. Cheek. Uh, rough to rough. Okay, you guys go around me. Let it go. She can go around me. Somebody's got to talk. The reason is, you know, we're on the radio. 
This is going out to New York. It's going Anyone to else want to spray? Connecticut. It's going up to Maine. They got a line all the way to Oregon, so my kids at home sit at home night to hear this program. You want to smoke a cigar? I'd love to. But as that young lady said, she was Give going to. Give me a match. Finish. It's just a match. I haven't had a match since. She said, Give me a match. Like Clinton, don't it have you're listening to the musings and ramblings of Peter Orlovsky and Ken This is Ken a Mont Blanc Epps. pen that costs four hundred dollars. You got a match for it? I do. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's match. Look at the right match here. We've been, we've matched out before. Right? Bobsy, this is a four hundred dollar pen, a Mont Blanc. You got a match for it? No, I don't. I don't. The only thing I have would even consider close would be this flute, which I have been playing tonight. Is actually Neil Cassidy's flute. I, did you know that, Peter? That's actually Neil Cassidy's flute. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, well, because because Neil Cassidy, when he became the driver of the bus in 1964, he drove us to New York City. Right. That's right. Neil was the greatest driver. He was. And he drove us to New York City, and he met up with Alan. And Alan went and got uh, Peter, and Peter's brother had just gotten out of the nut house. He was day. in a mental, my brother was in a mental hospital. Julius. Sent to lip for 13 years. Yeah, and his first night out, he got on the bus. And he did not want to get off. And Peter comes up to him and says, Julius, we got to go. <laughs> I mean, he boots. didn't have boots, his pants. <laughs> he didn't have boots, his pants. I know, but I never forget Peter there. He's always been the most... In but I never forget Peter there. He's always been the most endearing thing. He cleaned that up and was so sweet and nice. He never yelled. I mean, if that had been me, I'd have killed the guy. <laughs> no, I would not. Well, he really had not a prolapsed. Literally. He had a prolapsed rectum. You know what that is? Yeah, sure. I got one myself. Well, you gotta you gotta go to the hospital and have an rectum operation. Rectum hell nearly killed him. Well, my name is Peter A. Olowski. He sure you. is. You all know him as a poet and a mandolin, but a banjo player, right? I want everyone now to kiss each other on the lips for the next 10 minutes. This is too nasty for radio. They'll cut us off the air, I know. I also want you to do one more thing. I want you all to vote for Mayor Dinkins to make sure that the fascist Giuliani does not get in anymore. I'll say it again. Say it again, Peter. Say it again. All right, say it again, Peter. Vote for Mayor Dinkins. Who's he? Forget the fascist Giuliani. Yeah, right. Vote for Mayor important. Dinkins. It's very okay, important. I will. I will. What do I Mayor register? Dinkins is the best president of the United States that the United States will ever have outside of Peter Stuyvesant. Did he missed the election. It was Clinton, not Dinkins. The best mayor New York City ever had was Peter Stuyvesant. Yes! Right. Second best mayor New York City ever had was David Dinkins. Oh, Let's have that. a round of applause for David Dinkins. No way. Now, anybody in here who doesn't vote, raise your hands if you don't vote. I want to pick your eyes right now. You, uh, you got a problem with Dinkins? Why? He can't vote, he said. You've he got can't. to. You want okay. Bush and Reagan instead of Clinton? Okay. We just got rid of Reagan and Bush. Now you, you want to come back in again right away? Oh, now you may wonder how this guy got th Don't this information. Don't be stupid. He works on the railroad. So you can see all his pins, his railroad. No, this is police department. I'm Secret Service Police Department. These are all police. See the handcuff oh, one no here? no wonder he wouldn't smoke. Oh. Right <laughs> no. They I have can't to. I can't take any drugs. I used to shoot Coke. Coca-Cola? I used to. Brand. No. A hard lighter. Cocaine. Uh, goes to your brain. I used to shoot amphetamine in the 60s. Hey, I shot a, a bunny rabbit once. That's no good. What? No, you tell me, I was dead, drug down. Don't you do it again, I'll have to spank you. you. Know, I could, I, this is a I turned out 23 kids in about a week. Okay, but uh, without further ado, let me introduce my old friend here, uh, who was one of the uh, original beat guys that passed the torch on to us psychedelic orphans, Mr. Peter Olofsky, in case you didn't know. Give me a kiss. Have you Give me a kiss. He's not a homo like me. 
You know, the... I would have bought my book of, book of poems, but uh, no one told me this was a poetry reading. I'm a famous international poet. I'm a very rare poet. You only see one my type in a thousand years. My first name in my books and smiling vegetable songs. The reason it was called clean, Asable, uh, clean, clean asshole poems was because I, I went to the only farming high school in New York City in the early 40s and 40s. And when you work on a farm upstate, which I had to do, and I have a farm upstate New York, and I worked on it for five years in the early 70s, in the late 80s and the 70s, after Neil died uh, because he drank too much Mexican pokey. And uh, he was also on some downers. The combination is very deadly. The same thing had happened to Presley. Um, I was so, there for both of them. Right, right. And um, so, your cheeks get raw and um, dirty and sores. So you have to keep yourself clean in between. And I wrote a song just for yourself clean in between. And I wrote a song just for you. It's called Keep It Clean In Between. Keep it clean in between. You know exactly what I mean. Keep it clean, keep it clean, oh, so clean in between. Keep it clean in between. You know exactly what I mean. Keep it clean in between. Said the lady in blue to the gentleman in green. Keep it clean. In between, in between, keep it clean, in between, you know exactly what I mean. Clean, in between, exactly what I mean. Keep it clean with cold water protein. Keep it clean in between. Keep it clean. It's cold water protein. Keep it clean. Cold water protein in between. Keep it clean in between. With cold water protein. Cold water protein in between. Take it louder. It's a Gibson banjo. Made in 1929. I learned how to yodel from the radio. 1949. You can do it too. It's a song number two now. Let's stop it. This has got a yodel, boys. Get your, hey, we're just getting get your instruments to yodel now. Oh, no, no, no. No? Oh. I learned how to yodel from the radio. In 1940, I the radio and yodeling you. I've been learning how to yodel. I've been learning how to yodel. I've been learning how to yodel. I wanted to read you a poem. Would you like a little short poem? Yes. Yes. The kind of poetry that I write now is called Doha's. Have you heard of Doha's? It's a four-line poet, poem. My guru, my Buddhist meditation master, the Vijayadara 
Chagyam Trungpa taught me how to write Dohas. Dohas is an ancient form of writing poetry that's 2,000 years old. The first great Doha writer was Saraha. And you can buy the book and study it in your literature classes here because everyone goes to Columbia and Harvard here, right? And why you? Well, that's just as good, but it's not as good as Harvard and Columbia. <laughs> Sorry, you gotta speak the truth when you hear it. But it was called The Royal Songs of Saraha. Saraha was a Buddhist and also a Shambhaliist. Now, you don't know what the word Shambhala means. And you barely know what the word Buddha means. We're trying to give you an education here. We're trying to send you to Harvard in your seats. <laughs> Got an ashtray there, honey. <clears throat> Saraha. <clears throat> first learn to make arrows from a lady in the village square. And then he's got so hot he was chased. Finally, the queen and king at that time heard about his behavior. Heard about his behavior. And to distract him, they asked him to write some royal songs. And he wrote the royal songs of Saraha. And those, the form that he wrote it in is called a Doha. A Doha is a four line short poem. The first three lines are very fast and rapid. The fourth line is the rainbow ribbon that ties the three lines and is like the punchline. Now I'll give you a spontaneous example of a Doha. Just because your eyes are green, that's good. Just because your eyes are red, that's sweet. Just because your eyes are white, that's neat. But remember, when you cry, you cry just to your feet. Keep jamming, boys. Gracias. Thanks a million. No, because you sprayed me with that stinko perfume. Is that right? That's what does it. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Hey, Howard, what a man, huh? Have you ever heard him do that thing about the blackberries and the, and the raspberries? And he gets in there and goes... Well, it's pretty good when he does it. <laughs> okay, well, so you see uh, what the connection line is here where these guys talk about being old doofs and everything. Well, they're only 10 years older than I am. They all came through that generation like Cassidy did, about 1926 born, up through the World War II, and then out into America after World War II to spread the word that we're okay. We're not brutal killers and uh, sneakers and cheaters and trying to get that dollar out of his pocket so it can go into my pocket? No, that isn't what it's about. We found that out, right? Okay, now it's coming around again. All right, so that's the sermon. We've had the invocation. We've had the sermon now. We had Peter doing the uh, little dance step that led us into the thing. And now we got a young man coming up here. He's not really young at all, but his name is Victor, and he is the author of books about uh, Muhammad. That's Muhammad Ali. <laughs> that was before or after he was Cassius. And then William Burroughs, Andy Warhol, and Keith Richards. And he is currently working on a biography of Lou Reed. Lou Reed? Was he the man that did it? Uh, Lou Reed? Did he cross the San Francisco Bay or was that, I think, somebody else? Did he? Sitting on the, was he sitting on the dock of the bay? Or was that Lou Reed? No. What was a Lou Reed song? No. No, it wasn't a Lou Reed song. Okay. No. 
Heroin was a Lou Reed song. He sang that song? I didn't know he did the song. Or did he do the drug? Did he do the drug or the song? The song. Okay, it goes like this, heroin. You go out in the corner and there's a guy standing there and he comes up to you in a way that says, Hey, buddy, what you doing? How you doing this? And you go, uh-oh, what's he want, a hand out? No, he doesn't want a hand out. What's he want to do, make friends? No, he doesn't want to make friends. And you realize, what's he doing? And you realize on every corner there's one and they're all doing it. And they got it. And they give it. And you give in that. And you get it. And then you go down from it. But Lou Reed, did he go down? Okay, but coming up from Lou Reed's down is Victor Bacris. Is that how he spelled it? Victor Bacris. Thank you very much. Just okay. you. This is dedicated to Neil Cassidy in memory and eats in heaven still. It's called Punk Sex. The first time I the first were in Denny's like three in the morning and there was this really drunk guy and this black light came up drunk guy and this black light came up to us and said see that drunk guy he wants to go with you girls so he took us to a hotel and it was a really sleazy hotel and the guy who was so drunk and old that he couldn't get it up up we were yelling at him and he would say oh please please give me more head and we would say 15 more dollars we ended up with three hundred dollars each we took all his money we said if you want to call his money you will have to give it us more money then he would try to fuck us and he couldn't keep it up so I finally said well fuck you you can't even keep it up what are you doing you are wasting our time we are not going to stay here forever he said but I paid you girls we said so what he said but I paid you girls we said so what you were just a drunk you can't keep it up dick and we don't want to do it anyway we took that money and we were really happy by the time we were done then we went over to the Ramada Inn because we wanted to meet Kiss. That was when we went to the Ramada Inn because we wanted to meet Kiss. That was when Kiss first came to Hollywood. <laughs> when we were hard up for money, we would go to the hotels and see what bands were in. Then we went to the coffee shop and ordered whatever we wanted and just signed somebody's name in a band and the room number. So we lived off the bands without the bands really knowing it. They probably were so drunk and stoned all the time they thought they had eaten. These people from Leo Sayers' room took my girlfriend and made a face on her butt and stuck a cigarette in her ass and took a picture. And you really couldn't tell it was an ass, but then Lisa's mother, who was fucking this guy in Silverhead, was at the Hyatt, and she ran into somebody from one of these bands, and they said, look at these pictures we have of this girl Lisa. And it's like she said, that's my daughter. I have of this girl Lisa. And it's like she said, that's my daughter. And then she blamed it all on me, and because I was older. Lisa was 14, so she threw me out of the house. So I got a job working at a stripper on Broadway. I was working at the Garden of Eden. Hey, why aren't you guys playing? You know. <laughs> I met this guy, Rudy, and I, I, I moved in with him in North Beach to this really sleazy hotel, and he was a junkie. And this girl named Sunshine came around and said, if you need uh, to make money, I will take you to this hotel. It is nothing but Chinese guys. They only pay $15, but they are consistent. You can go there every day if you need to, and they will give you, not too loud, not too loud, baby. I want to hear what I'm saying. And the money... <laughs> and uh, they're consistent. You can go there every day if you need to, and they will give you money, and they only take about five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Fuck around. Uh, and they are polite, and they can't speak English anyway. So they took me down there, and everybody knew me, immediately liked me a lot, and they were giving me like $20 instead of 15 And as a matter of fact, after she took me down there, Sunshine couldn't even get into the hotel anymore. So after about four days, I would go over to the hotel. At s I was introduced to the guys by the manager. There was no lobby there. There was just rooms. 
And there was this one room that was just rooms. And there was this one room where everybody would get together around seven o'clock and play Ma Young. And I would go in the room where they played and one guy would lock up and motion to me. And when he finished with the games, he'd take me off in his room. It seemed crooked or something. The, ug the ugliest pudgy little dicks I ever saw. Dicks. They were in their late 40s and 50s. They all had really bad teeth. Well, lots of gold teeth. They would just go, oh, well, lots of gold teeth. Fucky fuck, fucky fuck. Oh, beautiful fucky fuck. Crooked dicks. Oh, crooked dicks. Listening to, well, we're listening to all sorts of things here at the Neil Cassidy Memorial Broadcast, broadcasting live Glory from Fez. Buy a new life, leave your kids and shoot your wife. Ladies and gentlemen, Victor Bach. And I put on my dark glasses and I wasn't able to see a bit of it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> One of my best fans. <laughs> okay, well, I'm so depressed now. Now, what would you think of a man named Christian? Huh? I like that name, too. Now, you remember the best Christian of all was Christian Leitner. No, no, that's basketball. It was the guy on the good ship, what was it, that uh, got lollipop, that was it? No, it was not Moby. Moby. I want to go say the word again. Uh, I mean, uh, just like uh, Paul Krasner says, he says, uh, you know, you can write and talk about Dick Tracy, but you cannot write and talk about Tracy's dick. Dick Tra He's right. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Double entendre. Okay, you heard enough of that stuff. We're going to go into the straight stuff now. The, yes? The straight stuff now. The, yes? Pardon me? Oh, quite, quite, quite. All right. So, Christian, my friend. Hunka. Is that right? Hunter. Hunter. What's the matter with these glasses? Oh, oh, watch it. Watch it. Hey, I meant to say this. Did you know that this radio station, KFMU, was kicked off the air for a week and its owner was fined $50,000 because they week and its owner one night on the air? <laughs> so, what do you think this is going tonight? That's going upstairs into the cafe. Upstairs into the cafe. Okay, now. This young man who is now addressing us and coming forward has a biography that stretches from now into 1952. 
Yes. It's, well, I mean, look at it. It's like reading a roll of toilet paper. I mean, if you could read the damn thing. Ah, oh, there you go, Captain. He's a New York novelist, an author, and what is the name of one of his books? Uh-oh. This could be bad. This could be bad. Absence of Angels. Katrina and the Nazis. God, I hate this like that. It's going to be included in the Unbearables Anthology, released this summer. Hey, you know the neat thing about Neil Cassidy? Now, you know, you heard these guys talk about these poems, you know, and, and anthologize his body and all the parts and all that. But that guy was so straight. I mean, he never even swore. Uh, he'd tell these stories and that, you know, and he always had a message, too, like the best one, you know, about the, uh, going around this curve, can't get around that, you know, it's got a flat and all that, but then you feel sheepish, kind of creepish. But the main thing is... Remember, whatever in the way is going to join you, they ain't working against you. Remember that. And when that day comes, you don't have to worry. Them forces are going to join you. Okay, so that's why we can get through this. Aha! Released this summer by Simon Semio. Semio? Semio text. Got it? Where is Robert? I just thought it was you. <laughs> Robert, man, hey, how you doing? Glad to meet you. Okay, you came out of nowhere. Yeah, all right. Ladies, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to, and you're listening to WFMU, Uppsala College, Orange East. This is a piece I'd like to dedicate <clears throat> to my friend David Rattray, who really, by all, he should be here. He really should be here. But unfortunately, he's kind of sick tonight. Anyhow. The big girl was born in Bad Honigen and Rhine, you know, Germany. She was the daughter of Rear Admiral Dad and her morphine-addicted mother who was dying of leukemia. When she was five years old, she came to New York on the SS Bremen, and there on the dock she was presented to her new stepmother, who up until five minutes before meeting her didn't even know she existed. See, Admiral Dad thought that telling his new bride-to-be that he had seven sons and a daughter was a matter that could wait till a more opportune time. She was raised in Blackpool, Oklahoma, with the oil rigs pumping in her backyard. You might think a person could become restless if she were beautiful, blonde-eyed, 16 years old, playing those Mott the Hoople MC5 New York Dolls records on a pitiful portable picnic player, and watching the oil rigs pumping in her backyard, it being 110 degrees in the shade in Blackpool, Oklahoma, she got restless. She hitchhiked as far as South Bend, Indiana, spent the last of her cash for a Greyhound in New York, went straight to Max's, Kansas City, got a job as a waitress, and quickly began collecting pieces of her life puzzle. She said she had to find them soon. She did everything with a sense of immediacy. Some of the pieces of her life puzzle included meeting famous people, you know, rock stars and writers, painters, Keith, Lou, Iggy, Andy, and being famous was a part of her puzzle. Fifteen minutes more or less, it didn't matter, as long as it was now. She waited tables with Donna Destry and changed her name from Donna to Dana. It wouldn't do for two inseparable friends to have the same first name. For a while, she was being chased all over by a TV film crew. Lance Loud, her first New York boyfriend, had lots of surplus minutes of fame that he could spare. So they went to Europe. So did the film crew. You could watch them once a week on Channel 13, drinking wine, eating croissants, brushing their teeth, wasting Wasting time, you know, fame. Well, then Lance decides to come out of the closet and she was out of the picture fame-wise and working back at Max's where everyone loved her. Her friends would later recount as she'd bend her 5 foot 11 frame over a customer with a tray of Bloody Marys in her right hand while surgically removing his wallet with her left hand, her bright smiling eyes pinned to the max. Did I mention she was left-handed? On a good night, which was five wallets and more, she made enough to pay her share of the rent and score a bundle and maybe then some which she might share with Paul or Johnny or Lydia or any number of sure-to-be-famous types that hung out upstairs at Max's, and on a bad night, if asked what her preferred drug was, if they said, isn't heroin the only thing, your one true love, she'd say, honey, what do you have that's water-soluble? Bring it over here. 
See, her real love was Verlaine, who everyone said that he dumped her for that skinny Patty Smith chick, who everyone said would be real famous someday. Patty Smith chick, who everyone said would be real famous someday, but she wasted no time readjusting. Next thing you know, she's living with a guitar player from the John Collins band, his name being Gary Seven. His band would never be famous, but he repaired guitars for the famous, which seemed to be the next best thing. What with Lou and Chris and Iggy and Bronson and Thunders dropping by the house at all hours, paying for guitar repairs for the most part with the occasional eight ball, guest list favors, a little something from Lucky Seven, or maybe a 75-year-old bottle of cognac, none of which was legal tender in the eyes of the landlady when rent time came around. So she took a job as a barmaid at the Playboy Club to support her dope habit and his famous friend habit, but then she had to get on a methadone program, because you see, Playboy Bunny Akuda Ma included perfect skin, floppy ears, high heels, Mondo cleavage, the mile-high smile, and no track marks. Not that anyone ever stared at the crook of her arm much. Well, it didn't take long for the whole scene to get real stale, which in a way was kind of a shame, because things don't usually get old so fast when you've just turned 20 and your whole life is still ahead of you. So one day she shows up at my door with one of those ratty-ass plaid nylon suitcases with a guarantee to break zipper that only closed halfway. Her plan, unbeknownst to me, was to lock herself up in my spare room and get clean or die, which for a junkie are the only two choices that matter. Not knowing she was an addict, I made her welcome. Welcome to my table, welcome to my keys, welcome to my bed. See, I'd known her for six years and I had lusted for her like Vice President Nixon had lusted for the number one spot. That first night I woke up around 4 a.m. and I was thrashing around the fridge looking for something to drink when I found this brown paper bag with the top all twisted closed and a rubber band to keep it tight. It was 330 milligrams of weekend take-home methadone and an assortment of Placidol's Valley and Percodan. My heart started racing, and I felt like I was going to go into shock because I knew it was major life decision time. I'm talking 10 seconds over Tokyo, standing there in the kitchen with all these voices echoing around in my head like Jimmy Stewart's conscience saying, Once a junkie, always a junkie, and don't get involved with a junkie or they'll just break your fucking heart. Well, I knew the only thing to do was to kick her ass out first thing in the morning. 8 a.m. seemed an auspicious hour for her departure. It'd give her all day to find someplace else to stay. I was resigned to throwing out this stunning 5'11", blonde-haired, blue-eyed rock and roll waitress just as soon as 8 a.m. rolled around. Well, I laid down next to her. 9 a.m. rolled around, and then 10 a.m. rolled around, and then it was three days later. But on day three, I told her, I said, you, you got to marry me. And, right. and she I'm said, yes. Right. See, I was no stranger to obsession or instant gratification, though I had strayed from my path. You know the one I'm talking about. It's the one that you set out to search and destroy, always certain that you're the one that will never crash and burn. But I'd gotten bored, which is what happens when you become boring. But now I'd found a road partner who understood that getting there isn't half the fun. It's just all there ever is. Yeah, Thanks. got it. All right. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen. All right, now we're cooking. cooking. That was cooking, wasn't it? That was in the flow. That's where we're going to go. Well, ladies and gentlemen. We bring you from the pits of New York to the tip of New York, the tip of the fun. All of New York tonight will merge at the Fez. And I'm so glad to let you know that on behalf of tonight's show and the fact that everybody's reading, I did too bring a little to read. Rebar. <laughs> Rebar. 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 That? <laughs> that was a joke. A little to read. But to spare you any further misery, at one time Cassidy Zonk, Ann Atkinson, and Terrell Zamboni rode around Manhattan. It was Manhattaning. Speakers were roaring like a caucus of crows, circusing, calliope-like echoing off of movie camaraderie. Wide open apertures. Tim performed at the noon preview of the Poly Pavilion Acid Tests. The show got canceled. Who, the manager asked, was that girl playing the ukulele? Nobody knows Tiny Tim anymore. Sad case. He plays for circuses now, you know. And they asked him, Tiny, how can you go out there every day when there's only two people here? And play that mandolin and sing that song and perform so wonderfully? 
And he said, I love the music. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a converted school bus and take me as far away from Al Grossman as the highway will allow? Janis Joplin said when she got on the bus, Slug, 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 duck, dumps up the capstan and decaying tape heads, spider web against the earphones, and the, the L train comes zooming by, and the man with the bad back lies on the floor, and he's cured. Earphones transmit the words, plunk into the eyeballs, radio windows of the world. Marshall Efren, you remember him down on Bleecker Street? He's our man wandering, TV genius, a name, a household name in Love Optics. Come on, Marshall. That's right. I remember with Wavy and uh, Wavy, and but Tiny he wasn't Tim. Wavy then. No, yes, he was. That's right. That's right. Who was he then? He had you had Romney. Got, this is a guy that gave T, uh, Hugh Romney, Wavy Gravy, all his names. Yeah. What was that next name? It was uh, oh God. He had about ten of them there in a row. No, my mind is poisoned, so I don't. Well, it's like I know. <laughs> I know. It's like uh, Leary said to me. He says, "If you remember the well, I mean, that. you weren't there." <laughs> well, I was <laughs> there. I, was I know, there. but he yeah. says, "If you remember the '60s, you weren't there." <laughs> No, I don't. But then I did. You were there then. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Okay. I remember. I remember a, a couple things that happened. I had a radio show. I know I had a radio show. <laughs> I used to do it once every two weeks, from midnight to about five o'clock in the morning, on KPFK. Ah, right. And you used to listen to it. That's right. But you, but you forgot. Well, I know the station no. well. Okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't uh, matter. I, I do. don't care. Uh, I have no pride. No ego. Nothing. Oh, yeah? No. You look like you're doing all right no, to me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't has got care. stature. Uh, or squatcher. Squatcher. Uh, squat Sasquatcher. Thank you. Bigfoot. <laughs> That's right. Bigfoot is it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a poet, but he doesn't know no, it. No, his feet, feet show it. They're long fellows. Hey, where'd you go to school? I think I went there, too. No, you're from Oregon. <laughs> That's Oregon, that's, that's right. right. Don't that's ever right. say Oregon. I never do. No, I wouldn't either. I well, I'm a Californian. We had a war with Oregon about, what, five, six years ago? Damn right. Who won? Nobody. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Californians would drive into Oregon and have their cars burned. Uh, and and, and Oregonians come Oregon, down to California and have their cars, their cars burned. impounded. <laughs> that was a bad time for everybody. We I know, but it. thank we God we're through it. those days, yes. What we had... What we had in that time when you and I were young, when yeah. we were young, lady, was that we were always in search of the higher high. That's true. We really were looking for that which would set us apart from our own heads. That's we true. We wanted to sit in a chair and have our tongue lay in our lap. Ah. You know? <laughs> I know. It's never made it sense either. No. Belly button sometimes. You stand there and you're scratching your hand. Uh -huh. And it doesn't matter whether it itches or it doesn't. No, it's not even your hand. <laughs> it's like that time we went in the uh, John to take a leak and I was eating a hot dog. your hot dog or eating your dick. <laughs> See, I tell those kind of stories. And you too. went different. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't care. You went different. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't care. <laughs> no, and that was it. We did beautiful know scenes. What, beautiful. <laughs> what was the drug? There was it was always on the horizon. There was always another drug. Always something, and we kept hearing about this thing: tasteless, colorless, odorless. Lay you out. Oh yeah, we were looking for it. Looking for it. Was the it. church, the great yeah. high? Wasn't that something? Yeah, you're not yeah. kidding. The sundown was always the time we gathered. We if we found out during the '60s, if we didn't get high and play and sing the sundown, it wouldn't happen. Wasted day. Yeah, you're not kidding. You had to do that every you, day. You didn't get high. You lost that day. That That's was right. gone. Gone. Forget it. Wasted. We we started at a time when there was such a thing as the nickel bag. That's right. I and remember that well. It ten dollars. That's right. That's right. Nickel bag. It was all seeds and all stems. Uh -huh. 
And a mellow heart. Mellow and yeah. oily and greasy, and yeah. the stuff would stick all over your lips. Uh, you rubbed it on. The, we rubbed it on the paper to get it on the paper, the gum on the paper, That's so it. It would, you'd smoke it when you had that gum on there. And the big argument was, do you use zigzag or bamboo? I mean, hey, so one so paper so or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't make no. up my mind. oh, guys, that is not organic paper. Don't smoke that. The paper ruins your lungs. And we had such a thing as a cocktail. The little little roach would go at oh. the end of the cigarette to oh. save it. Beautiful. That's right. I had this buddy of mine, Paige Browning. <laughs> it was just he'd do that. I, Paige Browning did it. One time, he sucked in a little, uh, one of those little uh, roaches. Little roaches. It went yeah. down. Uh, he coughed it. It went up in his nose. He blew it out of his nose and started smoking it again. Or you sit there. You sit there in your room. And you make the joint. And you light her up. And you take two puffs. And you think the cops are going to kick the door in? Uh, any minute. No! And this is, this is the kind they'd roll, these tiny little things, because you had to make that last. You little matchsticks doing just like oh, that. No, I won't do it in public. Thank you. No. This is not real. A this is a age. performance. This no, is a performance. Forget it. I won't touch that stuff. You Nothing can't anymore. do this up here on the stage totally like this. Reform. We'd get arrested. We, we would be arrested. It's, I, 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 it's I not real. Up. It's I a fake. No, these are props. Hold yeah, it right there. I, I'm holding it right here. Right here, officer. Come up and try it, officer. You'll find this is a decided prop. I decided it was a prop. So we are going to UCLA. Uh -huh. It's around 1959-60. Yeah. My friends Keith and Hal come to me and they say, we're going for something bigger. Ooh. I said, and, and what, pray tell, is bigger? They said, the magic cactus. Oh, oh yes. Oh. Peyote. I said, peyote. Peyote. I said, well, how are we going to get that? And they said, that's how we came to you. Oh, uh -huh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, said, uh, uh, I was known as the thinker in those yeah, days. I yeah. said, all right, here's what we'll do. <laughs> said, Before it was gone upstairs. I said, let's meet, let's meet uh, on Friday at 2 o'clock in the Botanical Library. I think, I think we'll look at the magazines. Some of those succulent digests might have some information. That's right. The and scent. We'll be under S for scents. Exactly. And we want to look it up and make sure, find out what the scientific name is so we can order it by its scientific name. That's it. That's it. What so, is it? Well, let me tell you. So okay. we went to the books and we started cranking the books. We found it was called... Lofafra Williamsii. Lofafra. Lofafra Williamsii. Lofafra okay. Lazamia. Armed, armed with that information, Lofafra yeah. Williamsii. Williamsii. We started going to the magazines. Let's see if we can find somebody who sells Lofafra Williamsii. Flip, 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 flip. All of a sudden, there in the headline letters, two big, that big, peyote. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Somebody. I have a price list. Helen's Cactus of Brownsville, Texas. Yes, yes. We'll send you peyote if you send money to her. We did it. Three kinds yeah, of peyote. Three times, four, you, five. Get, you can have the dried out peyote, just the buds. Just that's $125 for a thousand. Oh, that's good. Yeah. For, a, for a hundred dollars, you get the whole plant. The whole plant. And for $65, the whole plant and the root. Root two. So we didn't know any better. And we sent her, courtesy of the name of B.B. Davis on Sawtell Boulevard in Los Angeles, a, a check for $65 for 1,000 whole peyote cacti with root. With root. And we thought they would come in two shoeboxes. No. Not at all. What did it come in? Oh, wait. We got a letter. It said, go to Yuma, Arizona. What? What do you mean? Because you can't bring it into California. The truck stops here. Go to Yuma, Arizona, to the Texas Arizona Truck Lines place, and you can pick up your boxes of Lafafra Williamsia. Williamsia. Also known as Peyote. So we left at 3.30 in the morning in a VW Beetle, because we didn't know how much peyote a thousand whole plants with roots would be. I drove out from Los Angeles to Yuma, Arizona, to the Texas Arizona Trucking Warehouse, and we oh. found the place all right, and we gave them the purchase order with the B.B. Davis name on it, yeah. and they showed us two huge, big boxes that said Kotex. Kotex! 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 Kotex boxes that carried several groceries of Kotex, and there were two of them. How the hell do you fit that into a tiny... A, 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 a Volkswagen with just little guys, big guys, cut the top guys off. like us. No, we didn't. We didn't cut the top off. We squeezed the two big boxes.
boxes into the back seat. And my friends Keith and Hal in the front seat. Oh, but something happened. What happened? Carrying the second box Ooh. from the warehouse to the car, yeah. there was a rent in the box, Ooh. and these peyotes kept falling out. No. The rent was this big, Ooh. like two fifty. So I picked them up and I put them in my sweatshirt like this. And then we shoved them back in the boxes. Then we went to a Woolworth store in Yuma and we got tape and twine and string and other stuff to bind up the box. Because each box, the most boxes had a big pink, big pink certificate on the top that certified that the contents of these boxes were free of root rot, certified by the Texas State Department of Agriculture. Wow. And the problem was, because we went to the law library, we discovered that the contents of these boxes, which were certified free of root rot by the Texas State Department of Agriculture, were also a controlled substance in the state of California. Oh my God. Uh-oh. For $65, we could all do 15 years of peace in jail. At least. But who cares? We may. We're going to eat two of them. So, we went to the All-American Canal. All right. And we fixed up the box and put all the stuff was in there and we jammed the two boxes in the back seat of the Volkswagen and my friends wouldn't let me help so I, I don't like to leave a mess beside a clean canal called the All-American Canal so I picked up the extra tape and the twine and I put the little a little price tag that was on a string on the handle of the front of the Volkswagen Beetle so it just hung down it said Woolworth 69 cents alright now we're driving to California. California. Cross the canal. We crossed the state line. Yeah, we're in California now. And we're driving down the road. Here we go. And the road on both sides of us is tremendous desert. Oh, yeah. Nothing but sand as and far as the eye can see. Remember Marlena Dietrich in the movie Morocco? And, and she followed Gary Cooper off to the trackless waste? Same waste out there. And, and when, when uh, Maria Montez and John Hall used to ride across the desert, the Technicolor oh, yes. Olympics, same waste. It was same waste. hundreds and hundreds of miles of nothing but sand, 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 and no vegetation on either side of the state of California Agricultural Inspection Station by the road. you uh, got to stop there. And what do you got in those boxes, son? Peyote, Lafafra, Williams, a controlled substance. We give ourselves up, but not... Not that, quite. Didn't, that didn't happen. We pulled in behind a large DeSoto. Oh. And they were closing the hood, the trunk, the back door, the front door, the other back door, the other back door, and the front door, and the car drove off. And then we drove in. And we were shaking like this. This guy gets nervous. Oh, God, please protect us. Oh, if there is a God in heaven. He thinks I'm the Only drugs. Please, please, something should happen. So the guy says, hi, fellas, can I look in the trunk? Oh, the trunk? Hey, no problem. Nothing in the trunk but uh, smelly sweatshirt and uh, yeah. some medical equipment. Because yeah. Keith is a doctor. That's right. So he, opens, he goes around to the front of the car to open the trunk. And the next thing you know, he's on the ground. His feet are kicking the ground. He's laying there. He's gasping for breath. I'll be darned. What did he get a gasp of? He saw that little price tag. It was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. It cracked him up. It cracked him up. Ah, we got on top of him and said, oh, what's it like here in the desert? You see oh. many animals? Do you watch television? Do any ah, shows come yeah. here? Do you meet people? What goes on? That's Is it a boring? Is it boring? type of thing. This is what exactly. he was the best at. That was what he was. That's his point of this whole story. The guy laughed and laughed and laughed. To huh? get back in the car, guys, yeah. I got business and we drove off with yeah. the peyote. Yeah. And that's how we got the peyote oh, into shit, California. The term, looking for the digger yeah. high. That's right, the digger high. You get high if you get through the sick. That's right. I still have a growing peyote cactus from 1964. We did the same thing. Yes, I'm from that same place, Brownsville. Flowers. Yeah, flowers that stays loud. Yeah. Yeah. Never eat that. Dude. A couple weeks later, I got a phone call from Lenny Bruce. And Lenny said, What are you doing? I looked at my watch, it was 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday night, and I said, I'm just in bed watching television. He said, well, put on Channel 9 at 4.20, 4.20 this morning. I said, what? He said, just do that. I can't talk. I have other calls to make. Now, Channel 9 at that time, from midnight on Saturday night all the way to 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, had a program called Rocket to Stardom, sponsored by Yako Oldsmobile. 
And this show was a talent show for total amateurs. Anybody can get on and anybody can perform. So I watched, starting at four o'clock in the morning, there was a little four-year-old boy in a tuxedo, and he was conducting to a recording of Tchaikovsky. And I got rid of him. And then there was a girl who came on and tap danced, and she ended. And then all of a sudden, on came Lenny Bruce. Oh, great man himself. Great man himself, dressed in a waiter's tuxedo. He had a small pencil line mustache on his face. And a guy named Tony Visconti was standing behind him with a large accordion. And the, uh, Betty Yackel said to him, and uh, who are you? And Lenny said, my name is Vito Abruzzi. Vito! And she said, what are you going to do, Vito? And he said, I am going to sing Lady of Spain. So he turned to Tony, exactly. And Tony started to vamp. So, Lenny Vant, he vamped a long time, and then he just stood there like this. He vamped, he vamped. He just stood there like this, they vamped. And then he started to sing. Lady of Spain, I adore you. And then suddenly, he threw himself down on the floor and had epileptic effects. Betty Yackel rushed in. The floor director rushed in. One of the cameramen rushed in. Wow. He threw them off. Boom. Lady of Spain, I adore you. Right from the moment I saw you. Sorry, one more thing to say. And that's the first time I saw Neil Cassidy, because this comes to a point. Was at the first acid test at Muir Beach. I came in late. Most everybody was unconscious or semi-conscious. And there in this large, wooden, brown, reddish room, I saw this guy, and I'll never forget him. This is December of 65. It was Neil Cassidy, but I didn't know his name at that time. Is that right? That's the first time you ever saw Cassidy? First time I ever saw oh, Cassidy. Yeah. And he was pushing a brown chair across the room. That was Owsley. That was Owsley? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, that was it. That's that's exactly. Well, I didn't know. I thought it was him. Cassidy had this, found this washing machine, an old dishwasher, back in the kitchen, and he came out and he was playing the hoses. Yeah, and getting this dishwasher going on this big long uh, cord, you know, spouting water out all the time. Dow, dow, dow. Well, I'm destroyed. Right. All Rebar. these years, I thought that was Neil. Wow, that's what see? that's what this is all about. You come out here and you get yes, wiped we're, out. We're straightening the record. Yeah, I'm just so glad I'm high right now. Me so. too. I'll catch you later. Thanks a lot, Marshall. Later. Okay, man, that was great. Thanks a lot, Marshall. Marshall Lemon, Lemon. That was great. Because we're on a time slot with radio and everything, we're going to have to kind of pick it up here now. I know that this is probably boring anyway, right? No, don't say it in the Okay, Mike Golden's up next. He's the publisher of Smoke Signals. He's a nom novelist and filmmaker. All right, we're going to start cutting down here about six minutes each. Okay, Mike. Hey, Mike. How you doing, man? Hey, good. Good to see you. Yeah. See on this Unfortunately, I won't be able to read my whole manuscript. <laughs> I'll read it for you. Uh, this is uh, what came after the Beats. A lot of things came after the Beats. Still coming. There's a group called the Unbearables, which have been sort of, well, they're they're moving and grooving, and they're in this they? part of the, Who are they? Well, I'm going to tell you. This is what this is about. This is where they came from. Uh, uh, a short piece of where the Unbearables came from. Uh, in this day and age, certain truths are not always self-evident, but the unbearable beatniks alight are on a roll tonight. Truth is in sight, because tonight, on the occasion of their return to New York City, on the occasion of their first meeting in over two... Can you hear me? Talk into the mic. Oh, yeah. 
I talk into the mic. Okay, on their first meeting in over two years, they've unanimously agreed to give up the old ways, the old thoughts, the old attachments that held them prisoners for so long to a time and place that never really existed as anything other than a state of mind despite media hype and career conspiracies to the contrary. We're talking about downtown hipsters, as if you couldn't have guessed. The unbearables have been on the road for the last couple of years, choosing the apex of the scene to split for different parts, unknown, unglued, and yes, of all, most of all, unhyped hipsters. Like dust to the wind, they got gone just before the bottom fell out of the East Village Gallery and performance scene, riding their memories of hot times in the old alphabet town off into the existential sunset, leaving the club scene floggers behind to celebrate for nothing more than the glory of the glory as Robert Frank once described the Sam Shepard departure for greener pastures. Yo! In the old, old, good old days, remember those were the days, my friends, the days we thought would never end. The unbearables who are not really beatniks, but a literate group of fun-loving post-post-modern media casualties used to meet every other Tuesday night in certain, certain downtown watering holes and drown themselves in nostalgia for what else but the good old days. A disease of the spirit, hipsters, which on reflection everybody now agrees comes out sounding like a cross between Dodge City Saturday night and an unenforceable DMZ right in the heart of junkie land. Ah, but we're starting to toss grenades before we even choose up sides. First, the unbearable beatniks alike, who come to us courtesy of a spoonerism one slosh night, while noting that for some unfathomable reason all of the really groovy chicks were into Kundera's the unbearable whiteness of being. As individuals or a group, they are always caught somewhere in the middle, too young to be real beatniks, too old to be hippies, too late to be punks, but always hanging out on one cutting edge or another all their lives. They first started hanging with each other two years before it became obvious the end was the end and nothing else could begin until the corpse was buried. In previous incarnations, they were all seemingly involved and now be generically classified as the downtown scene. Since the unbearable gaff first occurred, and since at heart they're all democratic anarchists, they picked their beatnik code names, Jack, Neil, Alan, Bill, Gregory, Herbert, etc. Out of a hat every meeting. So last time you were Jack, this time you might be Neil or Alan or Bill or Gregory, etc. What this does, tonight's Alan explains to me, is it takes us out of ourselves, out of indulging in our own personal problems. Tonight's Alan has just spent the last two years living in suburbia, saving his marriage by helping his wife's brother open a shopping center outside of Youngstown, Ohio. You know what I'm talking about, he says. The wife flipped it. I didn't get the raise. The lease ran out and the scumbags were raising the rent from 289.50 to 1400. At the same time, by changing names every week, none of us get trapped in any one persona. This way, tonight's Neil explains, it stays sort of a healthy schizoid exercise as opposed to a real schizoid existence. Tonight's Neil, who used to be a well-known Soho bartender before he moved to Barcelona, originally came to the Lower East Side from England in 75, virtually penniless. He likes to remember little tidbits like when the subway and a slice of pizza both cost 35 cents. I thought it was the bloody law they had to cost the same thing, he laughs. Tonight's Alan, he used to manage a bookstore on what he calls the heart's heart of the beast, Remembers fondly, almost too fondly, the days when the Lower East Side was considered no man's land. The Hell's Angels ran the neighborhood. Junkies and shooting parlors proliferated. And that doesn't even go back to the days of the Electric Circus. Tonight's Jack comes back to the table after he's finished reading from his novel in the back room. A well-known DJ, before he packed it in the mood to Paris to write the great American novel, he first came to the Lower East Side 11 years ago from East Jesus, Nebraska to freak out. But it was too late. The Fillmore was closed, the heads had all splattered, then scattered, got gone, back to the land, and left the streets to the speed freaks. It's been a while since I've heard that word, muses tonight's Bill. A tall, elegant anthropology professor who spends most of his time out of the city shutting shamanism in remote, remote corners of the world. What word, tonight's Jack asks? Freak? No, speed, tonight's Bill smiles. Remember speed? The real thing, tonight's Neil smiles. I haven't heard the word in ten years. What happened to speed? It just sort of disappeared. Cocaine tonight's Alan Weasels, the non-addictive yuppie elixir. Thank God I'm allergic to it. Suddenly a loud roar comes from the crowd as tonight's Gregory comes out of the back room and climbs up on top of the bar to read an old favorite to the poetry-hungry mob. Not again tonight's Bill puts his hands over his eyes. He's not going to do his hi, hi, tonight's Gregory roars from the top of his tonsils. How high can you fly before you die, he sings out. Then pounds his chest like he's Tarzan and has just spotted the bitch goddess news on the other side of the river. He lets loose a loud, soul-cleansing call to all the animas of the lower east and west sides, then does a perfect swan dive off the bar, splattering headfirst on the concrete. Oh. The unbearables at the table turn back away from the human puddle on the floor and one by one lift their hands like diving judges. 
an eight from tonight's Neil, a nine from tonight's Alan, a six from tonight's Bill, a seven from tonight's Jack, and then back to business as usual. By the time tonight's Gregory has been loaded on a slab and carted away, everyone's delivering a different way to find their own separate reality. Though it should be pointed out to all you undercover DA agents out there, the unbearables are drug-free now, considering their taste bouts, marriages, and indulgences with pharmaceuticals and herbs as merely phases, rites of passage they had to undergo to get to where they are now. We're just pawns in the detoxification of America, tonight's Bill insists. These memories, the way things are, as bad as any addiction I've ever had. Worse than tobacco, tonight's Jack wheezes. Maudlin, sentimental, and politically incorrect, tonight's Alan moans. Which is exactly why I miss them, tonight's Neil proclaims. I like doing things for the bloody toss of it. That's why I moved here in the first place. Where's your bloody spirit, mates? Have we turned into a coven of wussies? Isn't there one bloody gesture among us? Listen to Neil. He's got a wild hair tonight. Tonight's Jack laughs. But hey, there ain't no more America to bang bang, much less a nouveau York. Not that Paris is that much better now, but at least it looks good. And hey, nobody can say the frogs don't give good attitude. In reality, they may be vapid, they may be shallow, they may be total blanks, but you got to admit their shells are cool. Here, everything and everyone's redundant. Nothing but the same ghouls and necrophiles in the club scene. Taking care of their egos, baby. Taking care of their egos. Bit harsh, old boy. Some of my best friends are ghouls and necrophiles, tonight's Neil grimaces. Matter of fact, I do believe it's my heritage as well. The addiction kicks back in then. The good old days before they realize that are back. The glory of Dorinka, the shuttle, 8 BC. All sacrifices to gentrification become a litany. Normandy, Anzio, just a regular Guadalcanal diary, hipsters. Before long, the unbearables are sloshing through the minefields of memory. The feast of unbraining at the theater for New City. Don Cherry blowing the shuttle's lights out in a line. Carol and Finley's first yam. Seymour Crim's last reading at Tarinka. The performances, readings, and parties at the Rivington School Sculpture Garden. The New Year's Day Marathon at the Poetry Project. When tonight's Gregory was standing in line to get a urinal when the real Gregory himself stumbles in. Takes one look at the long line. Then straggers, sackers, straight up, straggers, straight up. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what you tell a poet, they're going to go on and on. And on and on and on. No offense to Mike Golden, who's on the stage right now, but this program has got to go on and on and on and on. Peter Orlovsky sitting across the table. Greetings and salutations. Peter Orlovsky, the famous international poet. Say it. The, the original Peter Orlovsky, the, the famous, famous international poet. One of the Say original it. Married to Allen Ginsberg for 40 years. 40. <laughs> And Kim, biblical. Kim Spurlock, or Oral, and Neil Cassidy's ghost lover. That's right. Boyfriend, worshiper, and Adonis. It's good to have you here, Peter. Thank you, sweetheart. Truly, truly a welcome thank performance. You, thank you, Mr. Jim. <laughs> I'm Nick. Well, Mr. Diamond. Okay. Call me Nick Diamond. <laughs> well, Just let him have it. There's a, Come on, Kim, give it to him. Well, Just let him have it. There's a, Come on, Kim, give it to him. There's a bleep in the air for you. More than that, there's a diamond in the air for you. <laughs> for you, I didn't say for me. Peter. Tonight you were talking. You were talking politics. Do you remember? Yes. The, do you remember a guy in the '60s free speech movement in Berkeley named Stu Alpert? One of the of things. One of the things he said was, he said, "After the revolution, we can go back to being beats." What do you think about that? What about this? Things that Mayor Dinkins. Yeah, Mayor Dinkins is the best president the United States will ever have. How about Peter Stuyvesant? The first one was Peter Stuyvesant. Right. The second is Mayor Dinkins. And it's very important for all the voters and the non-voters to vote for Mayor Dickens because he's against the fascist Mussolini Giuliani. Yeah. You understand? It's very important now that we, had, uh, we have a good mayor in New York City. I'm not speaking like Jesse Jackson. He certainly... Because Dickens is better than Jesse Jackson by a million fold. There's no comparison between Jesse Jackson and David Dinkins. Dinkins is our sweetheart. Peter. Jesse Jackson is a foreigner, so to speak. He's, he's a hot-headed. 
Peter. I met Martin Luther King. Peter Dinkins. I met Martin Luther King. Yeah, Martin Luther King. Luther King. I met Martin Luther King. What was he like? We went. We were at a party together with Eleanor Roosevelt, me and Allen Ginsberg. Right. She was cute. A wonderful woman. Yes. She was better than that. Gregory saw her on the was, subway once. Yeah. She's like Hillary Clinton. Well, Hillary Clinton is trying to imitate, to be like Eleanor Roosevelt. In her sexuality as well? No. <laughs> no. No. Eleanor Roosevelt was above sexuality. That's right. She was a uh, she was above. Virgin. She was above sexuality. She saw the suffering that America was going through. She saw the bloody wars that were going to come up in America. Saint Eleanor. She was the first real heroine of America. We must not degrade Eleanor Roosevelt, but remember her name and bring out everything good from her. And you remember she is the hero of American politics. And you, you met her with Martin Luther King? I met her with Martin Luther King. What were they doing together? And I asked, and then after, they were, we were up at a very expensive party for Martin Luther King to raise money for his movement. Right. Up at Dorothy Norman's house on East 70th Street, in the Museum of Metropolitan of Art. Mm -hmm. After the party, and I saw Martin Luther King there. What would you, what'd you think of him? He was surrounded by his workers, the secretaries, who were very astute. After the, I saw him and I looked and I said, he had Buddha lips. Buddha lips. Then we went to a Chinese restaurant, had a big meal. I asked him, you got a better idea tonight's bill, Martin, did you have a dream last night? Here, the yes, he had a dream. The dream, of the dream was that he was nailing the nails to his coffin. He was in the coffin, and the nails were being nailed. Get a man slowly, very slowly, mm. Knew he was going to die. It turned out to be shot. Good. They took inside the Knew it. Yeah. One last round. And, uh, and I asked him, did you have a dream last George. night? Because I I'm Obviously, a, things aren't the same uh, poet, and I, I used to, when I was 18, I used to read Franz Kafka. Mm -hmm. Kafka used to write his dreams down. Okay. Mm. Ladies and, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Mike Golden. Martin Luther King. Hey, it's like one second. Hey, Bams. Hey, That's a beautiful story. Man. We're talking to you back here from the booth. Come in, booth. This is the stage. Bring me in the booth. Bring Hi, baby. Hey, baby. I know. It's I Peter know. Orlovsky here. I hear it's Peter Orlovsky, world famous poet. International world International famous International world oh, famous far. poet, please. And I'd like to give you a new fresh poem. All right. Since everyone is standing on their head. All right. Ice cream is blue. Blue. Blue cheese is green. Green. Vote for Mayor Dinkins. He's the best <laughs> president of the United States outside of Peter Stuyvesant. Peter, same name. He's, otherwise, you're going to get the fascist Giuliani like Mussolini. Good one, Peter. Have you ever heard of a fascist? Good one, Peter. Huge Pluto is over here on the left, my left. And over here on the right, we have angel headed hipsters all joining in for the free form spontaneity. Now, like Peter said, though, don't stand or sit on your hands. Join in at any moment. I mean, this is the Holy Church of the Gospel of the uh, St. Kerouac, and led by Neil Cassidy, down it. through Ginsburg to all of us. So let it go out. There's no fun just sitting around listening to other people having fun. Amen and amen. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're broadcasting live from ah, Fez on Let's see, there's some Lafayette and Great Jones Street. Street. This is WFMU. Got a joint? I had one, but I passed FM. it around and never came back. Upsala uh, College, East Orange, you know New Jersey. As, I, as well as I do, it was the only kind you could have then was the kind that's This is Ken Babs on the stage yeah. right but now. But we'll, that'll be coming up a little later. Excuse me. All right. Richard Hell, are you here? He lives a floor above Allen Ginsberg, and he's promised to keep this down to four minutes. All right, I'm going to time you. I got to say that uh, Neil Cassidy didn't, re didn't really mean all that much to me. I never met the guy. When I think of him, I think of Jack Kerouac, who, who wrote some books that moved me. Um, so I didn't know how to really, I was kind of stumped about how to approach this. 
Um, but then when I thought of Jack Kerouac and sort of memories of people, it did make me think of this little poem. It's not something that I wrote, but it's by, at least by a guy that I met and who I liked. <laughs> um, his name was Ted Berrigan, and uh, he wrote this poem that uh, really kind of sums it all up for me. Um, and he wrote it right after Jack died. And uh, he dedicated it to Jack Kerouac. And uh, it's sort of like the best beatnik stuff, I think. Sort of like the best stuff I liked is soulful and sweet and funny. Um, it's called Telegram, but unlike the beatniks, it's, it's short, too. Mm. Yeah. Telegram goes like this. Bye-bye, Jack. See you soon. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Hell. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Richard. That was tremendous. I see, we're advancing. Yeah. The thing that I learned when I finally heard myself approaching from the heavens was when we came in 1964 on the bus and Neil introduced us to Alan and to uh, Peter and to Jack Kerouac and these guys, we realized we were on the same line, that the line has extended from very long time to us and we are all on this same line hey. and it really cuts across the uh, ages and uh, across the class the consciousness and that one of the greatest things in america to me is the fact that any american can talk to any other american it doesn't matter what language or what country you're from or what your station in life is you can roam up and down through the class levels vertically in america not just horizontally and when we get to a point where we're only crossing horizontally, then we know we're not doing our job. So I exhort all of you tonight, all the rest of your lives, continue to move up and down the vertical ladder. Talk to the lowest and talk to the highest as a one American to another in whatever language it takes. There aren't, but now I'm glad you brought that up. That is true. This was pretty much a male-oriented scene, but in the 60s, after the beats in the 59, in the 50s, into the psychedelic revolution, suddenly things started merging really fast. And since then, it's been like that. We're all in this together. Men, women, kids, dogs, trains. But the women got to have the same voice. They got a brain. They got thoughts. They got ideals. They got the same juice that we do. And we don't want any more Thelma and Louise. <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't don't let these men trick you into doing the same dumb things that men have been doing for years and act like it's something good. <laughs> so Emily Y X Y Z, she's maybe at the bottom of the alphabet, but she's at the top of reading an Allen Ginsberg poem. Are you here, Emily? All right, good. See, that's good timing. <laughs> Oh, that's what I was supposed to say. She's accompanied by Myers Burt. Bartlett. Bartlett. Right? Bartlett? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay, good. No problem. Okay, good. Right. Now, remember, when you shake hands, as my daddy said, you're only here for a little time, so get as much meat as you can. Good hands. Yeah. My daddy taught me that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Hey, man. What's going on? All right. <clears throat> this is a poem by Allen Ginsberg, and it's called... Get right on it. Get right on it. Home Bomb. And it's written in 1971, and I heard him read uh, this poem at Tompkins Park a few years ago, uh, so I appropriated it. Oh. <laughs> Um, we bomb them. We bomb them. Boom bomb. 
bomb. We bomb them. Boom bomb. We bomb them. Boom bomb. You bomb you. 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 What do we do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, we bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, we bomb them. What do you do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, we bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, we bomb them. Boom bomb. 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 You bomb you. 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 What do we do? Who do we bomb? 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 What do we do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? You bomb, you bomb them. What do we do? We bomb, we bomb them. Boom bomb. We bomb them. Boom bomb. We bomb them. Boom bomb. of you for coming and um, Myers and I are going to be hosting a killer performance show at the Cafe No Bar on 9th Street between Avenues A and 1st on uh, 26th of February and that will be featuring Edwin Torres, Mike Tyler and the fabulous Paul Skiff. Thank you. At 7.30. Hey, this, this is the hippest act we've had so far. That this is where the where it's going to is that uh, it's not just words, ju not just music. It's words, music, and it's performance, and it's joining in with everybody going on it. You get the mood when they're going. Oom bam, oom bam, ba doom bam, oom bam, oom bam, ba doom bam. What's that carrot you got there, Ken? Well, you know we're organic out in Oregon, Nick, and we have to eat our vegetables and yogurt. Yogurt for sure. Ken Babs brought me a quart of yogurt from the Fair Creamery, the Nancy's Creamery in Springfield, Oregon, which was one of the most pleasurable quarts of yogurt that I've ever experienced, and I want to thank you in public. You're quite welcome, and you're going to be getting more in the mail, I promise you that. I mean, this is a true, true, true devotee and a true, true health food. That's right. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the now the mailing list, the yogurt mailing list from uh, Ken Babs from Oregon. I'm going to open the yogurt club. I want to thank you all for coming to this uh, Neil Cassidy Memorial broadcast, the fifth anniversary broadcast of the Music Faucet. Thank you for coming, too, Ken. You're quite welcome. It's been my pleasure. I have no better time in the world than coming to places like New York and meeting everybody and grooving because everybody is so good. I want to give a special warm, warm hand for the angel-headed hipsters over here on our right. Yeah.